Hi there, I'm Lee Redhead, a writer and member of Sisters in Crime Australia. Welcome to Scarlet Stiletto Bites, scintillating short stories by Australian women. Our weekly podcast is designed for busy lives. Each murder mystery is short, but not always sweet. Expect twisted tales, quirky humour, imagination, and a frisson of feminism. Sisters in Crime Australia's Scarlet Stiletto Awards were established in 1994 to unearth criminal literary talent. We're producing these podcasts of winning stories to celebrate the sisters' 30th anniversary ceremony in Melbourne in late 2023. The concept designer and narrator is fellow sister, actor, barrister, broadcaster, and best-selling true crime author, Susanna Lopez. Hello, Susanna here. Today's story explores the mean streets of Sin City, St Kilda. Petty crime is commonplace. Major crime sometimes hits the street community very hard. And warning, there are strong adult themes and language in this story. Darkness in the Port by Philomena Horsley First Prize, Scarlet Stiletto Awards 2018 I cradle Mickey's child body with my bloody hands, trying to press back the coil of guts spilling from his belly. His eyes flash at me, shocked, bewildered, then fading. I lay him gently on the icy concrete floor, then bolt for the exit. I roam the back streets of St Kilda. I drift across to the Port 3207 zone when I need to get away from the others. It's not that the people in Port are fewer, but they are the beautiful people. Well off, well fed, well dressed in that wealthy, downbeat way. They don't see me. What's to see? Small and stringy. Eleven, maybe. Fifteen? I can look younger or older, depending on what clothes I snatch from the op shops. I go young when I want to hang out in the library. It seems safer. I don't get so many concerned or distrusting looks from staff. Why would a kid that young be on the streets? I need those books. Crave them. It's not that hard convincing local kids to sell me their library card. Terrible how little they care about books. Idiots. At night I hang with Sasha a bit. She worked for a time in the licensed brothels, but she says the streets give her more freedom. Yeah, and more bruises. She pays me a bit to be a lookout for her. I'm good with faces, number plates, really good. I mean, I never forget them. Photographic, Sasha says, so I can warn her, warn the others when the creeps drive up. The ugly mugs, the ones who always want to do weird things, the ones who squeeze the women's throats too hard or rip them off. Well, sometimes I've had to suck a bit of cock to get by, like Mickey. But I don't put myself out there much. Mostly I, I hang in the shadows, looking out for scum, warning the working girls. I've got good instincts too. I can really sense the bad in some people. And the real goodness too. The women say I have a gift. That's how I knew Shelley was safe. She used to visit the libraries a lot. That's how we met. And sometimes I would carry her books home for her. But it's got too hard for her. She's too stiff, too creaky, she tells me. So now I take her card and go to Port's library and choose her books. 
She likes romance, crime, any of those grand stories from English history. Best if they are in big print, though. Of course, I can remember everything she's read, so I don't get the same ones. I expect the star think I'm her family. I deliver the books to Shelley and have a wash-up, all my clothes, and, and she makes me a meal. Then we sit together on the couch and read. I can stay and sleep on the couch if I want to. I know she knows I'm on my own, and she won't tell. But this'll all end soon. Her family started coming around now. And not because they care. No, not that. They just want to move her into a home so they can take her home. She got no hope against that lot. Anyway, I'll I'll have to find another option soon. Maybe Alice. She's a really good person. I, I just feel it. She works in one of the libraries I visit. I think she has me sussed. She was cautious and friendly when we first started chatting. Not in my face. I think she knows I'll scram from that place not to be seen again if she mentions help, people who can help, services or whatever. We talk books mostly, safe stuff, but I know I impress her with my ideas. I can relax a bit with her, though I try not to. I can tell she likes me. She's curious but careful, (laughs) like me. I know where she lives. I followed her home carefully, so I know she lives alone. It's off Graham Street, a worn-out-looking house, one of those places with an old laundry and toilet still outside. I've used that space a few times to wash up, being really careful to leave it as I found it nothing out of place. Sometimes I, I have a look inside. Alice's house is full of books, piles on the kitchen table, on the floors, by her bed. I can't see their titles through her windows, but those ragged stacks of stories warm me every time. At times I've been tempted to climb inside and borrow a few, but I respect Alice and I just don't steal from people. Except from op shops. They're supposed to be there to help people like me anyway. And from stupid rich people who leave their stuff in their cars, practically giving it away. I'm hanging out with Sasha and some of the others. It's pretty early still, but it's gloomy. Winter feels harder, colder when you're near the sea. The wind blows dark, mean, painful. Business is slow. Maybe on a night like this, even the regulars want to be on the warm couch with their boring old wives. Sharp headlights suddenly swing round through the corner, lighting up our grim street pocket. Run, I yell. Cops! Most of us scatter, except for the few girls too new to know the drill, too new to know they should trust my warning. Handbags swing and high heels pump around me as we sprint to the corner towards lights and shops and, hopefully, obscurity. Sasha and I dash into the McDonald's and plonk ourselves in a booth. Tingling from the sudden warmth on cold, bare skin, laughing like hyenas. How do you do that? she gasps. I shrug, roll my eyes. Don't know, really. Something about the way that car slunk around the corner set me off. Just just a vibe. I saw the number plate as we ran. Cops from the Paran shop, not sure what they're doing here. Well, I owe you a burger, kiddo. Hey, do you want to crash at my place tonight after? I, I think I'm done for the evening. I nod gratefully. Sasha heads to the counter to order. Her tiny sixth floor flat can be a great option, but I know after most nights with those scummy men, she usually likes to go home alone, clean up, drop a few tabs and visit her blissful private dreams. 
And honestly, I feel pressed against the walls by that tiny space. Too high up, nowhere to run, to, to get away. But tonight feels right. The doors swing open and two men enter, showering me with chilly air in every way. I glance outside. There's the car parked illegally near the verge. It's the same one we fled. One of the guys ambles over, pouchy, pock-faced. I can tell he's bored, looking to warm up his night with a bit of hassling. What are you doing out so late on your own, kid? What's your story? Just then, Sasha is back at the table, tray in hand. Why, officer, sir, Jazz is with me. We are just feeding up after a wonderful night at the opera. He looks at her quizzically, sees what he sees, but he knows it's a public place and he can't do much, and anyway, it's too much bother. Well, make sure you're in bed by midnight, he commands, faking a caring tone. Both of you, he adds, giving Sasha a knowing look. We leap on the burgers, sauce oozing from our smirking mouths. Mickey and I have nestled into a sandy niche between the grassy mounds at Lagoon Pier. We've climbed over the barbed wire fence, off limits to all but us and the squawking gulls. We can lie here unseen. Back of us, there's the familiar traffic hum, the growl of big trucks changing gear. If we lift our heads to the sea, we can follow the slow progress of the bulky freight ships, cartoon cutouts on the horizon. Close by, gentle waves lap the shallow shoreline, rhythmic but erratic. This is one of my favourite places. From the pier you can see the sentry line of palm trees curve all the way around the bay to St Kilda. At night, the standing lights along the pier hang their heads and cast a a magical glow over the boards. Mickey and I lie together, eyes closed, slightly warmed by the winter sun on our faces. It's a thing we like to do when we catch up. The breeze sends the faint chlorine tang of fresh bunk my way from Mickey's clothes. His opportunistic session with the mug is the reason we're feeling well fed. I'm worried about Mickey. I know he's feeling down and and he's getting reckless on the streets. Mickey has been spat out too many times by the system. A few years ago, after he had his 12-year-old asshole drilled by his last foster dad's big dick... Mickey decided the streets were a lot friendlier and safer. Sure, survival came with a lot more dick, but at least it paid. Which meant he could get the stuff he needed to numb himself or or lift himself, keep himself bright for the blokes. But Mickey's ageing too fast. More man than boy now. And the rich gents want them young. I've started to feel Mickey slowly untethering from life. He rolls over slowly and squints at me. The afternoon sun gives his skin a a healthy glow it doesn't deserve. You heading out with Sash and the others tonight around Grey Street? Yeah, maybe. Why? I thought I might tag along. There's a spot nearby where I've got lucky a few times in the past. Simple stuff, blokes on heat, any dick sucker will do. Oh, okay. I'll hang with you for a while, see that you don't get into any trouble. I tried throwing a cheeky grin at Mickey, but even I knew it was pretty empty. He reached over and touched my cheek, just a light feather down my cheek to the corner of my mouth. I really love you, Jazz, you know. He whispers, you are so tough. You're you're stronger than me, so much smarter. Smarter than anyone. Yeah, well that's what you get from too much reading, I joke, trying to lighten the mood. Yeah, well, I can't wait to see you out of this shit, set up in the world proper. 
But hey, don't forget this ignorant fuck up when you make it. He throws this at me fiercely. So of course I punch him. Looking back, I wish we'd lingered a little longer in the snuggle of that sand. Mickey turns up very late. He's wearing his favourite black puffer jacket, black pipe jeans showcasing his sparrow legs. He's doped on something. Sasha takes one look at him, rolls her eyes and shoves him down the street away. She won't work fucked up. Says she'd rather enjoy the benefits of that stuff in the comfort of her own home. I wander down behind him, anxious. Not a great way to go, Mickey, I mutter to him. He ignores me. Fair enough. A sleek, sporty silver car turns the corner. It idles on the other side of the road, 50 metres down, bugs hazing in its lights. The driver sits quietly in the dark, waiting, watching. It it doesn't feel right. There's a pain in my chest bone, a, a deep jab. Mickey starts to amble down to the car. I grab at him, but he shakes me off. Oh, I'm just checking it out. Be cool. He flicks at me. He leans on the bonnet of the car, chatting with the driver. Then he moves over to the passenger side to get in. My chest gets fierce, explodes in shrapnel. Mickey, no! I scream, jagged, hoarse. He looks up briefly, stares at me. Defiant, puffed up in his black jacket. Then he shoots me a sad grin and pops a thumb. He bends into the car and it squeals a U-turn before I can even move. I start to chase. I can run. I'm a runner. I love it. Sand, bitumen, grass, I love it all. The spring in my legs, the gasp of my lungs, ears zinging with heat, the sense of flow that comes with distance. But not this running. This is desperate. Jagged, gut-busting stuff. I hurl myself into the night. I hit the corner and spill right into Beaconsfield Parade, panicked, desperate to find that car. Nothing. A few lazy headlights rolling my way. But not that silver glint. It's late, it's winter. Nothing much about. I think hard. Where would Mickey go if a guy wanted more than a suck? I start pounding down the bike path towards Metal Park. The car is starkly framed beneath the toilet block lights. No one around. I stagger to the entrance. Three kilometres is not a long run for me, but I ran this route hard with concrete in my chest. I step into the dim light. Mickey? Suddenly I'm slammed hard against the wall, then dropped onto my back. The man stands over me, grinning. He licks his fleshy lips slowly, eyes glinting, taking me in. My vision drops, catching the dark smudges on his shirt. And as I do, he kicks me in the guts hard and leaves. I push myself up against the wall and lurch into the change room. There's the knife. Here's Mickey. Oh, Mickey. I crouch under Lagoon Pier, behind the mossy round stumps, shaking, heaving into the damp sand. Blood coats my shirt, stinking me up, seeping into my pants. They'll be looking for me because I yelled, pointed to the block's entrance. But then I ran. I have to get somewhere safe, clean up. Uh, uh, Alice. I figure the route in my head, the back way. Soon I'm creeping into her backyard. She never locks the laundry. Once inside, I, I slump for a while on the cold concrete floor, almost too tired to stand. Then I heave myself up to the big sink, turn on the taps and strip. Suddenly the light flicks on and she's standing there, Alice, wide-eyed, bewildered. 
I clutch the bloody shirt to my chest. We sit in the warmth at her kitchen table. The stink has been washed off my body. Alice knows now it isn't mine. Some clean, scruffy clothes are found and folded to fit me. My fingers grasp a cup of tea. Hot. Lot of sugar. It's quiet at the table. Alice hasn't thrown any questions at me, but I can see them throbbing in her temple. I'm just so tired. But I'm wired. I pick up the top book from her stack. It's Invisible Man. Did you like this one? I query. I tried to read it last year, even though it was so old. That guy was so different to me, but but I think I got some of it. Even though it was another country, another time, it's still intense. There's a lot of nightmare in that book. She ignores me for a moment, then opens her mouth to speak. I haven't done anything wrong, I gasp out. Honestly, I tried to help someone who got hurt, but I couldn't help them. So I ran. I had to run. They they wouldn't believe me. I'm spent. I put my head down on the table. Alice rests her warm hand on the back of my neck. Finally, Alice speaks, suggesting we head to bed as it's nearly morning and we can talk then. She pulls out some blankets and a pillow and rolls her couch flat and I slither underneath all that and wait for being awake to the end. I'm holding Mickey, and he's screaming at me. Drop the knife! Drop the knife! And I'm trying to let it go, but my hand has frozen, and the knife is waving about, streaming blood on me. Then a hand grips my shoulder, and I punch out wildly. I punch out hard! just like I've learned to do on the streets. And I hear a cry, so I punch again, harder, and it's invisible me hitting that person. And I turn the knife, because I'm going to slit their throat, just like invisible man wants to. And then I, then I hear a moan, and I wake up. Alice is lying on the floor, face bleeding, and I, and I feel shock, then awful, drenching shame. And I run. Sasha tells me they're looking for me. Suddenly everyone wants to see me now. Corner me, catch me. Apparently I dropped a library card by Mickey's body. It's not me, of course. But they've tracked me to the library lending. I'm too regular for people not to notice. Too loyal to my books. Sasha will go to Alice's library and pass on my note to pass on to the police. The make and model of the car, the number plate. The police have to catch that dark man. I know he won't stop doing this stuff. I've seen those eyes, that grin. Sasha goes back to the library again a few days later. This time Alice is ready for her. Sasha says Alice's bruises are fading and she stands steady when Sasha approaches. She says to tell you the police told her that the owner of the car says it wasn't him. Someone took his car that night and then left it in the next block. She says they told her the owner is a hotshot lawyer, important, respectable. And they believe him, Alice says. Please, if you saw the killer's face, you could help the police if you can describe him. Alice says, please come and see me at home. I walk up the path to Alice's front door. I sit on the bottom step. I don't want to scare her. I'm really not that person from that night. She comes out and sits on the top step, but she smiles a little as she does it. We're waiting for the detective. He comes alone, which is good. Alice says he's a good man. I wouldn't know. I've never met any myself. He sits on the middle step to chat, which is funny, 
It's so not the three bears here. We go inside and Tony, that's the cop's name, shows me some pictures. It's the dark man there, plain as day. Probably a photo off a website. He's got a confident, serene smile, but I know different. Tony asked me if I'll go to court and say that it was him. I can. But what would happen to me if I say yes? I'm not going into the system, into care or or worse. Alice says she could give me a room at her place. No strings. She and Tony talk hard. School gets mentioned. Yeah, as if. Tony says I could be a protected witness. As they try to sort it out, I just think of Mickey, his big wrong choice. After Tony leaves, I go back to Sasha's place. She tells me, trust my gut on all this. I sit outside court three, waiting to be called. I've grown, but not that much. I've read a lot of books since that night. I still ferret out the good ones, classics. But I loafed through some Reacher books because Alice says it's good to let some light stuff in. Now, I'm trying to remember all the information the lawyer told me, how court works for real, not like TV. The door opens and I'm in court. There he is, the dark man. He's he's aged a bit, but he still looks handsome, well-fed, well-bred. He sits looking slightly perplexed, like he shouldn't even be here in this room. It's some big mistake. I'm also well-dressed. Alice made sure of that. The prosecutor takes me slowly, step by step, through that night. I'm stiff in my responses. I recount it fact by fact, image by image. I keep a steady voice. I know it's down to me. I'm asked to point out the culprit. And I do. I look at him. Really look at him. He tries to stare me down, but I won't bend my gaze to him. The defence lawyer stands, and my gut grips tight. I try to breathe. Slow and even, just like Alice said. The lawyer starts with my life on the streets. Of course he would. (laughs) I've read Helen Garner, so I know how naughty these blokes could get with witnesses. How they can act like they really believe the people they're defending are innocent. How outraged they are that these poor, ordinary blokes are caught up in such a bad luck story. Yes, I've hung out on streets with sex workers. Yes, I've sucked cock for money. But we don't use those exact words in the courtroom. He's trying to make me small, dirty, and disrespect my friends with his contempt. But I absorb it all. This is not about me. It's about Mickey. The lawyer's getting to his high point now, preening to the jury. So... Jazz, despite this sordid, chaotic life you've lived, you claim to have excellent recall on a dark winter's night, all this time later. I eye him off, his slinky suit and all. He's not so clever, just full of himself. I smile as innocently as I can. Yes, absolutely. And why should we believe you? Well, people have told me I have this photographic memory sort of thing because I can remember things so well. He turns to the jury. Well, that kind of thing has been debunked by science, as we know. I sit and wait patiently because I know he has to actually ask a question. He seems a bit annoyed and changes tack. So, Jazz, do you do drugs? Have you ever done drugs? Nope. What, never? Mock surprise. Nope, they fuck your brain and I really like mine. What about you? I hold his gaze. 
I've heard a lot about lawyers' parties. The jury chuckles. They're sure they know all about how Australian lawyers work from watching all those American shows. Mr Shiny Suit pauses a moment and I jump into the gap. I could never forget the night that Mickey was killed. We were special friends. We helped each other. We looked out for each other. He was not a piece of trash. But this man, and I pointed, this man carved him up like he was nobody. Nothing. And then he just drove away in a silver sports car, Rego H-E-R-061. My shoulders lift as Shiny Suit turns back to me and I steam on. And you came here yesterday in a pale blue shirt and green and red tie. You were dropped off outside by a blonde woman in her 20s driving a dark blue Merc. But on Monday you turned up in a white shirt with a blue and yellow tie and you were dropped off by a dark-haired woman in her 30s, white BMW. The court goes silent, except for a muffled moan in the pews. Probably the blonde woman from yesterday, but I don't look. I sit with Sasha in her tiny flat. We're sharing some Thai takeaway while talking about books. I finally got her reading something. She's balked at Michael Connolly. Well, I get that. Harry Bosch lives such a grim life, battling corruption on every side. Never ends well and he never bloody learns. On the other hand, she likes the Lee Child books. That Reacher, he just gets the job done. All the bad guys die, or at least walk away with serious nose damage. No agonising, bloody justice for all, then he moves on. As I will soon. We're at the start of another hot summer, and the beautiful people of the seaside and their pricey dogs are out marking their territory. The sea now feels too dark for me, too haunted. Dark man is in jail, but Mickey's still in the ground and I miss him. I sometimes lie quietly in a nook at Lagoon Pier, fingers trailing in the warm sand, feeling for Mickey. But mostly, I just want to run. The end. Thanks so much for listening. We'd love your feedback. Subscribe for free to Scarlet Stiletto Bites wherever you get podcasts. And do visit our website, sistersincrime.org.au.